The time is short. This message was first preached by Charles Haddon Spurgeon in the late 1800s. Our text for today comes from the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 7, verse 29. The time is short. The first thing we notice is that the text does not say that time is short. That would have been a true statement. Compared with eternity, time is smaller than the tip of a pin. But note what the text does say. The time is short. It is the time of your life on this earth. The space of your opportunity. The little time that you will spend on this world stage of action. That is what is short. The psalmist says, you have made my days as a handbreadth, and my age as nothing before you. Brothers and sisters, we are allotted a brief time on this earth in which we can serve the Lord our God. This is a truth which everybody believes, knows, and confesses. It is a common phrase on every tongue that the time is short. Yet how few of us act as if we really believed it. Oh, we are aware of the danger and the uncertainty of other people's lives, but somehow or other, we persuade ourselves that our time is not quite as limited as theirs. We think that we have ample time and a little bit more to spare, and we wonder that our neighbors can be so careless and wasteful of their days and years. For we observe the wrinkles on their forehead, we detect the gray hairs on their heads, and notice the sign of approaching death in their appearance, and thus believe that they will soon have to give an accounting of their life to God. Every man thinks that everyone else is mortal, but not himself. Why do you not see in yourself the winding down of your own life work, the weakening of your own strength, the thoughts of your own death and funeral? As a creature, you are frail. As a resident of the world, you are exposed to accidents and illnesses. As a man or a woman, there is a God-appointed number of days for you to live on this earth. You must be swept away by death. You must go with the rest of your generation. Ask an angel what he thinks of the life of a mortal, and he will tell you that he remembers when the first man, Adam, was created. And since then, the earth has been constantly changing out its residence. Perhaps he has a hard time remembering all the nations that have come and gone in countless succession. For a little while, these nations were in the forefront. Then they just passed away. Or, if you never met with an angel to question him, then seek the advice from one of your fellow creatures. Ask an old man what he thinks of life. He will tell you that when he was a boy, he thought that he had a long lifetime ahead of him. So many were the days of his youth, and he played away the hours, and was thankful when the time of his youth had ended. It was his strong desire to break loose from the moorings of childhood, and launch out into that great wide sea of uncertainty and opportunity. But now, he looks back on those 70 years that have been slowly accumulating. Through all the variable stages of our life's journey, the present time is always the most perplexing. It must be over and done with before it is understood. It seems to him it was only yesterday when he left his father's house to be on his own. Before long, wedding bells rang out for his marriage and now his children have reached their maturity, and his children's children 
climb up on his knee and call him grandfather. Yet he remembers when, as if it were just yesterday, that he himself was a little child and his grandfather held him in his arms. My dear friends, you can bear witness that I do not exaggerate when I speak like this. You can realize more vividly than I can paint the feeling of looking back over the entire span of your 70 years to your youth. This was a very long period, while to you it seems like only yesterday. Perhaps there are among us some gray-haired veterans, some elderly women, who need to be reminded that time is short. Present health and activity may tempt you to forget that your life is nearly over. What if your body is strong? What if the blush still lingers on your cheeks? You have nearly reached the goal, the allotted span of your years. To you, my aged friend, be assured that the hour of your departure is drawing near. Should five or even ten more years be granted to you, how quickly they will pass, just like your seventy years quickly fled by. At the flickering of life, you have no time to discuss and delay, to resolve, and yet to play with resolutions, to waste and squander golden opportunities. Why? Because the time is short. The time is short. But to evaluate this truth correctly, we must turn from the cycles the angels have witnessed and the seasons that may have come and gone in the memory of our grandfathers to consider the years of the right hand of the Most High God. Look into the Word of God. Take counsel of the Eternal God. Remember how it is written, a thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by or like a watch in the night. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years are like a day. We are a mist that appears for just a little while and then vanishes compared with God. Like the grass we spring up, and like the grass, we are mowed down. Compared with the lifetime of the eternal God, what is your life? No, there is no comparison. It is too insignificant. My days are like the evening shadow. I wither like grass. But you, O oh Lord, sit enthroned forever. Your renown endures through all generations. I have divided my message into four major points. Four things the message teaches us about the time is short. First, it warns. Secondly, it suggests. Thirdly, it inspires. And lastly, it alarms. It warns, it suggests, it inspires, it alarms. First, because the time is short, it warns. If you knew the true value of time, you would shrink back from the smallest waste of so precious a commodity. Knowing that the time is short, you and I do not have an hour to squander on worthless pastimes or amusements. There are some diversions which provide a break from the incessant strain of labor and anxiety and are beneficial to strengthen the mind and steady the nerves. These are not only allowable, but they are also right and proper, needful and helpful to keep the mental and physical powers in good working order. But the Christian, in their recreations, must seek healthy stimulations and avoid destructive activities. The time is short. Nor can we afford to plan a number of empty amusements to spend on an afternoon or an evening. It is said of Henry Martin that he never wasted an hour. I wish it could be said of us 
that we never wasted an hour of our own time nor an hour of other people's time. There is an ancient prophecy which I would love to see fulfilled in modern history. In David's Psalm of Praise, Psalm 145, David says this, All you have made will praise you, O Lord. Your saints will extol you. They will tell of the glory of your kingdom and speak of your might, so that all men may know of your mighty acts and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. By such a conversation as that, beloved, you might redeem the time in these evil days. But you are afraid of being charged with being overly spiritual or zealous, with pushing your religion a little too far. Oh, brothers and sisters, it is high time that we had a little more of that zeal and that we did push religion a little farther than it has been our habit. For golden opportunities are lost and profitable exchange of holy thoughts is regrettably neglected. In the old days, as recorded in the book of Malachi, those who feared the Lord talked with each other, and the Lord listened and heard. Not much of this prevails today among professing Christians. Not much is said today that is worth hearing, much less worth God's hearing. Because time is short and quickly flies away, I urge you to stop misusing your tongue. Furthermore, the time is much too short for indecision and wavering. Time is much too short for indecision and wavering. You make a resolution and then you rescind it. You make a plan and do not follow it. You sleep until it is time to get up, and as you start to get out of the bed, you sink back down into it, in a drowsier state than before. These are a mockery of life and a willful wasting of time. How many of you consider doing something noble in your life, but you never found a convenient time to carry it out? Perhaps you were on the verge of converting to Christ, but you stopped and now your convictions have grown cold. 10 or 20 years ago, you listened to the gospel appeal. My son, give me your heart. And you answered, I will, but not today. You have never fulfilled your word. Today, as before, you stand idle. Some of you, indeed, were in a more hopeful condition 30 or 40 years ago than you are today. What account can you give of yourself? What has become of those intervening years? The infinite mercy of God has kept you out of hell so far, but there is no guarantee that God's patience will shield you from the fires at another time. My friends, the time is short. Business is urgent. This crisis is imminent. It is madness to be wavering between two opinions. If God is God, then serve him. And if not, take the alternative and serve Satan. Let your mind be made up one way or the other without another moment's delay. And now you, Christian people, with all your grand plans, see how they melt away? Some of you may have done a great deal that would have been useful by now if you had not dreamed such big dreams that were overwhelming. Oh, what wonderful plans you had for evangelizing our entire city, for converting the whole country to Christ. These plans floated around in your brain and then evaporated and nothing was done. We are always projecting some wonderful scheme that proves too wonderful ever to be carried out. So we dream of what ought to be and should be, of what might be or even hope may be. Such dreams are the children of an idle brain. The dreamers grow lethargic 
and nothing is done. In the name of the eternal God, I implore you, if you love him, get to work for him. Do something, please do something. It is high time to awake out of your sleep, or the time is short. This next thought may serve to warn us against another folly, that of speculating upon points of controversial theology. You know how in years past, professors used to debate and argue how many angels could stand on the point of a needle? And with many other propositions, no less absurd, they wearied themselves. There is something of that spirit even today. Ministers will devote whole sermons to the discussion of some triviality that does not mean anything to anybody in the universe. One brother who meets with me occasionally cannot be in my company for five minutes before attacking the question of free will and predestination. I told him the last time I saw him that I would have it out with him one of these days, but I must defer it until after the day of judgment, for I was too busy to talk about it just now. But rather than all this speculation over trivial subjects, I would prefer to proclaim the cross of Christ and explain the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John than to try to decipher the imagery of the book of Revelation. Blessed is he who can expound those mysteries. But I am perfectly satisfied with another blessedness, namely, if I can bring sinners to Jesus and teach the saints some practical truths which may guide them in their daily life. It seems to me that the time is much too short. We need to save souls and guide them to heaven. This seems to me to be the most pressing demand on us right now, that the time is short and the night comes when no man can work. Let this next truth also admonish us, brothers and sisters, to a singleness of purpose, to a singleness of purpose. We must have only one aim. If we had plenty of time, we might try two or three plans at once, for even then we would most probably fail for a lack of concentrating our energies. But because we have very little time, we had better economize it by focusing on one thing. The man who devotes all of his thought and strength to the accomplishment of one reasonable object is usually successful. My friends, bow down and lay yourself out for the glory of God. Let this be the one aim of your entire soul, to live for the honor of Christ, and if necessary, even to die to promote his gospel among the sons of men. You waste your strength and squander away your opportunities by dividing your attention. You say that you want to be a Christian, but meanwhile, your heart is set on gaining wealth. You seek to fill your mind with the learning and wisdom of the world. Very well. I will not denounce any one of these things, but I would use every persuasive means to cause you who are true believers in Christ to renounce the world. Since Christ has bought you with his blood and redeemed you from this present evil world, he has a claim on you as his servant, and you run a great risk when you take up with any pursuits that are inconsistent with a full surrender of yourself to Christ. You belong to Christ, so live solely to Christ. Now our second major point today, because the time is short, it suggests, because the time is short, it suggests. Our days on earth are like a shadow, but fortunately, they may be radiant and leave a trail of light behind them. We are gifted with one major talent, time, and that gift is small. It is a gift so valued that it has to be carefully used. Be careful that it is never squandered, always usefully employed. 
that his careful expenditure can never be regretted. So gainfully invested that the faithful steward welcomes the coming of his Lord, ready and anxious to give his account of the talent they receive. Some of you who are unconverted can never hope to receive the greeting that awaits such a faithful servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. You have lost your golden opportunity. You have wasted your time in disorderly living. Are there any children here today to whom this is possible, being faithful with the time that God gives them in their life? Oh, for men and women with one ambition and one goal, to glorify the Lord. I do passionately desire that God would be greatly glorified in me. I have prayed and I do pray to Christ that he would make the most he can out of me, no matter what it costs me. What if, to this end, I must be thrown into the furnace of affliction and suffer for Christ's sake? I solemnly charge each Christian man and woman in the name of Christ who has redeemed you with his blood, prepare your minds for action and survey the course you have to run. Prepare to fight the good fight of faith in which you are engaged. Yield yourself up totally to the Lord Jesus Christ. Do not stop to deliberate. The time is short. Therefore, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. Now on to our third major point. Because the time is short, it inspires us. Because the time is short, it inspires us. It should fire us up with a zeal for immediate action. It should fire us up with a zeal for immediate action. Oh, the days rush by. The minutes tick faster and faster. Now is the accepted time. Let those who love the Lord be timely. Do not say, I will do this later on. Do it at once. Other duties await you. The time allotted to you to accomplish these is brief. Are your children converted? Pray with them tonight. Do not let tomorrow come without putting your arms around them and kneeling down with them and praying fervently that God would save their souls. The time is short for others as well as for yourself. A dear brother told me a week or two ago that a man who worked for him frequently brought in some finished goods to him. And he had planned that the next time the man came in, he would speak to him about his soul. But when he came in again, business absorbed the employer's attention and the man left. The brother did not know exactly why, but he felt pierced in his conscience and resolved that on the next occasion he would talk to him about his soul and eternity. But it was too late. Instead of coming again, a messenger brought the news that the man had died. Shocked by the news, our brother could find no comfort in regrets or self-reproach, for he grieved grieved as one who could not forgive himself a hundred wasted opportunities. Oh, that a divine inspiration would move you to serve the Lord right now. The time is so short and the matter is urgent. Do not wait, young people, to share the gospel of Christ until you learn more scripture. Begin at once. You who plan to do something for the poor of the city, when you have saved up some more money, spend your money now. Do it at once. You who intend to leave a large sum of money to charities when you die, do not put it off. Disperse the money at once. Get some joy and comfort out of it yourself. Before you were saved, the message to you was, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your heart. After you are saved, the message to you is, Today, obey Christ's voice and serve the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The time is short, so make the most of it.
The time is short. I want to ring this sentence louder and louder in your ears, that it may inspire you to pray for immediate conversions, that it may inspire you to pray for immediate conversion. I've met with some people who are hoping to get converted someday, but not today. Such procrastination is eternally dangerous. Do any of you dare to run the risk of willfully remaining in unbelief another hour? Can you tolerate the thought of remaining month after month in the jeopardy of your own soul? Is it safe to tempt God and provoke the anger of the Most High God? Oh, dear people, while you flatter yourselves with pleasing prospects, you are deceiving your hearts with a reckless presumption. We want you to be converted, and no time can be more suitable than this present time. Repent of your sin immediately. Do not turn back to toy with it any longer. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and lay hold of the promise of eternal life without further delay. You may never see another tomorrow or hear another gospel invitation because your heart will have become hardened. This is my prayer that you may, at this very hour, repent of your sins and put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Christians, seeing that the time is short, let us bear with patience the trials that trouble us, the trials that trouble us. Are you very poor? The time is short. Does the bitter cold pierce through your worn out clothing? The time is short. Is disease beginning to prey on your trembling body? The time is short. Are you being treated unkindly by your family and relatives? Do your friends despise you and your neighbors mock you? The time is short. Do you experience evil treatment from the wicked world? The time is short. Oh, you are traveling at a high speed and will soon be beyond the reach of all the incidents and accidents that disturb and distract us in this life. As you get closer to your Father's house in heaven, the distance diminishes and you begin to see the city of the blessed, the new Jerusalem. It is needless to murmur or fret. Why trouble yourselves about what you will do a month or two from now? You may not even be here. You may be in heaven. Your eyes will have beheld the King in all of his beauty. You will have seen the splendor and brilliance of heaven. And now we see that materialism does not become those of us who have confessed that we are strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Materialism does not become those of us who have confessed that we are strangers and pilgrims on the earth. The time is short in which we can hold on to any possessions in this earth. Then, let us not love anything here below too fondly. We brought nothing into the world, and it is certain that we can carry nothing out of it. Go ahead, count your money, but know that wealth will not give you immunity from sickness and sorrow. Neither will it secure your welfare when death comes. Trust in the living God, love the Lord, and let eternal things absorb your thoughts and occupy your affections. The time is short, so from now on, those who have wives should live as if they had none, those who mourn as if they did not, those who are happy as if they were not, those who buy something as if it were not theirs to keep, those who use the things of the world as if not engrossed in them. For this world, in its present form, is passing away. Are these gloomy reflections? No, dear brothers and sisters. The fact is 
that the time is short. And that should inspire us who are of the household of faith with the most joyous anticipations. Do you really believe in the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Do you really believe that your head will wear the golden crown of life? Do you really believe that those feet of yours will walk on streets of pure, transparent gold? Do you really believe that your hands will actually pick fruit from the trees of life that line the streets of heaven? Do you believe that your eyes will see the King in that day when he comes in his glory and that your body will rise from the grave and will be glorified and live for all eternity? Yes, you say, I do believe it, and I believe it intensely. Well then, I hope that you understand it as being so close that you are expecting it at any moment. Who would cry and fret about the passing troubles of a day when they saw the heavens open up and heard the voice that called them up? Oh, that the glory might come streaming into your soul until you forget the dark times of this life on earth. Oh, that the music of heaven would cheer you. Then you will speed your way towards the rest that remains for the people of God. Oh, but the ungodly, the wicked, they do not have this to look forward to. Thus it is to them that I must now address this last word. The time is short. Because the time is short, this alarms us. Because the time is short, this alarms us. And well it may, because of the unbeliever's lost state. Let the bell toll for his death. It is a depressing sound. For the unconverted man or woman to whom life has been a joy. For they have prospered in the world. They have succeeded in their life goals on which they had set their heart. They bought a home that they longed to have. It is certainly a fine place but they only have it for two or three years. Did I say two or three years? No, there is not a man beneath the sun who can guarantee that you will live in your home for three weeks. The time is short, very short, and your tenure is very limited. You have gained your goal, you possess real property, then what's next? Why? Go make your will, for that is urgent. The time is short. But what have you failed to do? You have not repented and believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. You have not embraced the gospel. You are not saved. You have not laid hold of eternal life. You do not have a hope to comfort you when your strength fails and you pant for breath. How few opportunities remain. Now some of you have attended my ministry during all the time I have been preaching in this city. I wonder how much longer you will hear me preach and yet remain unsaved. Your turn to die will finally come. You are a little sick right now. Your sickness is not responding to treatment. The symptoms now grow more serious. The disease is dangerous. Your death is imminent. Pain unnerves you. Terror distracts you. Your family and your friends look at you with helpless pity. The doctor has just left you in dismay. You may send for a priest or get the parson, but what can they do for you unless you repent and believe in Jesus Christ. It is over. The final struggle is over. Now picture yourself as a lost spirit in the fires of hell, begging for a drop of water to cool your tongue. That will be your portion, sinner, unless you repent. Stop and think. 
There is just one step between you and death. A short step between you and hell. Unless you believe in Jesus Christ. Do you still imagine that there is more time to repent? I implore you, do not cling to such a vain thought. Perhaps you suspect me of exaggerating. That I will not do in such a case like this. Time is rushing on, swiftly but silently. While I speak, the minutes pass. The hour is soon gone. The day is almost spent. I charge you then by the Holy Spirit of God, listen now to the warning. Escape from sin. Get off that broad road that leads to hell. Repent and believe in Jesus Christ and lay hold of eternal life. May the Spirit of God arouse you. May these words be blessed to you. With all the passion of my soul, I beg you, for I know your eternal life is in imminent danger. God grant that you may not linger any longer, for fear that you accidentally linger too long and perish in your lingering. The time is short. In just a little while, there will be a great crowd of people in the streets. I think I hear someone asking, what are all these people waiting for? Do you not know? He is to be buried today. And who is that? It is Spurgeon. What? The man that preached at the big church? Yes, yes, he is going to be buried today. My friends, this will happen very soon. And when you see my coffin carried to the silent grave, I would like every one of you, whether converted or not, be forced to say, O oh, Spurgeon, he strongly urged us in plain and simple language not to put off the consideration of eternal things. He begged us to look to Christ. Oh, may God grant that you will not have to bear the bitter reproach of your own conscience. But as I feel that the time is short, I will stir you up. So long as I am in this church, and I do pray that the Lord will bless the word every time I preach it from this pulpit. Oh, that some souls may be saved, that Jesus Christ may be glorified, Satan defeated, and heaven filled with saved ones. Amen.